Good day, this is Job Aguas, and welcome to my lectures in philosophy. This is part of my lectures in the philosophy of the human person. In this lecture, I will be focusing on the different philosophical notions about the human person. So we're going to survey the different notions of man, or conceptions of man, based on the Oriental and Western traditions. There are different understandings or conceptions of the human person. And we can generally classify these understandings according to the two main divisions of human civilizations, namely the Oriental or the Asian or Eastern and the Western or Occidental. The Oriental conceptions can be understood and classified according to the different philosophical or religious traditions in the East or in Asia. The Western can be understood and classified according to the historical development of philosophy in the West, starting from the Greeks. So let's focus first on the Oriental conceptions of man. First is according to Hinduism. The Hindu conception of man or the human person can be seen in the religious and philosophical doctrines which are found in their sacred texts, especially the Vedas and the Upanishads. The conception of the human person is closely related to his relationship, meaning man's relationship with the whole of reality. And in Hinduism, reality can be interpreted through the notions of the Brahman and the Atman. For the Hindu, the Brahman is the ultimate and underlying reality, while Atman is the individual reality. Everything is Brahman. Everything or the totality of reality is Brahman. Now, everything that we can see in that totality, we can know in that totality, is Brahman. But, the visible aspect of reality, the specific aspect of reality, the one that we can experience is the Atman. So the Brahman is something that is always present around us, but we cannot really point to it. What we can point, the aspect of reality that we can point to is the Atman. To use an example, we can feel the air all around us but we cannot really see it we can really point to it although it is all around us now imagine the air inside the balloon well we can point to the air inside the balloon we can identify the air inside the balloon it's the same air as outside of the balloon but in the case of the air of the balloon it is something that is specific now if you pop the balloon, then the air inside the balloon will join the air outside of the balloon. So the air inside the balloon is Atman. The air outside of the balloon, the air outside is Brahman. Consider the ocean, vast water of the ocean. That would be like the Brahman. Now you have the water coming from the rivers. That's the Atman. So when the river, the water of the river flows out to the sea, it joins the vast water of the ocean one again. So the human person is part of that reality. He is part or one with Brahman. But he is also a concrete and individual reality. Therefore, he is also an Atman. The ultimate goal of the human person is to be one with Brahman and to reach Nirvana. In order to do this, the human person or man must purify himself and detach himself from the world. Nirvana is attained when one is released or liberated from the earthly life. This release is called moksha. Now, if he does not attain this, then he is reincarnated or born again until he finally reached nirvana. The cycle of death and rebirth is called 
samsara. And one can attain a release from the samsara through enlightenment. Enlightenment starts with the understanding that this world is an illusion or maya. Now, when you say maya or illusion, it does not mean that the world is not really real. It is real because we can experience this world. However, this world is only temporary. It may appear to be like this, but in reality, the world is not. That's the meaning of the world being an illusion. Human action is governed by the law of karma. This law of karma states that the good will or the good action will result to something positive, a positive outcome. Bad action will result to bad outcome or bad results. Now, Hinduism recognizes three possible paths to attain moksha or liberation or salvation. They are the they are called methods or yogas. The sages have taught for reaching the goal of nirvana. So the first way of salvation or the first yoga is the way of knowledge or jhana yoga. The basic premise of the way of knowledge is that the cause of our bondage of the cycle of rebirth, meaning the cycle of samsara, is ignorance. Our ignorance consists of the mistaken belief that we are individual selves, that we are independent selves, and that, and not one with the ultimate reality, which is the Brahman. So we think of ourselves as a separate entity, separate from the Brahman. That is ignorance. So salvation is attained when we realize our identity with the Brahman. And this is achieved through deep meditation often as a part of the discipline of yoga. The second way is the way of works or karma yoga. This is very popular way of salvation and lays emphasis on the idea that liberation may be attained by fulfilling one's familial and social duties, thereby overcoming the weight of bad karma that one has accrued in his life or her life. It is ignorance that gives rise to bad actions, which is or which result in karma. The third way of salvation is the way of devotion or bhakti yoga. This is the way uh, most favored by the common people of India. It satisfies the longing for a more emotional and personal approach to religion. So it involves the surrender of the self to one of the many deities or many personal gods or goddesses of Hinduism. So this is like a way of devotion, being devoted to a particular god or goddess. Now let's go to the second uh, religion or philosophy of Oriental philosophy, Buddhism. The development of Buddhism or the Buddhist teachings can be traced to the life of its founder, Siddhartha Gautama Buddha. The life of Siddhartha Gautama is a constitutive part of his teaching. The history of Buddhism is the story of his own spiritual journey from the pain of suffering to enlightenment. The Buddhist teaching about man and ways of living developed from the Buddha's spiritual journey. By finding the path to enlightenment, Siddhartha Gautama was led from the pain of suffering and rebirth towards the path of enlightenment and became known as the Buddha. Buddha means the enlightened one. Siddhartha Gautama was actually a prince who enjoyed the luxury of life inside the palace. He was protected by his father because his father 
wanted him, of course, to be, succeed him in his throne. So, but there was a prophecy that Siddhartha might, might either be a king of this world or a king of the other world. And when the king asked, how could that be possible that he may not be, there's a possibility that he will not be the king of this world. Well, the monk told him that if he realized that life is suffering, then he will not be the king of this world. So, the king protected the prince so that he will not see the reality of the real world outside. But, when he was able to travel outside of the palace, he saw the suffering in the world. So, he saw an old man, a dead man, a sick man, and then finally he saw a monk. He realized that life is suffering. So he decided to leave the palace and search for a way to escape the inevitability of suffering. Suffering of death, suffering of old age, and suffering of pain or sickness. Siddhartha encountered an Indian ascetic who encouraged him to follow the life of extreme asceticism, extreme self-denial. He also practiced meditation, but he realized that the highest meditative states were not enough. Finally, he abandoned the strict life or lifestyle of self-denial and asceticism, and he did not return to the luxurious life inside the palace. Instead, he pursued the middle way, a life which is neither luxury or poverty or self denial. The Buddhist teaching about the human person or man is centered on the right understanding of reality in order to attain enlightenment. The Buddha believed that every human being could achieve enlightenment because he thought human nature and the universe have certain objective features which we can know. After meditating for a long time under the Buddha tree, Siddhartha Gautama awakened to a new vision of the nature of human life. As the Buddha, meaning the enlightened one, he saw himself and all life as part of an an ending process of change a great chain of being through of being through which all things came into and lived one form of existence for another the whole universe is a system of interconnected inseparable parts and composed of all varieties of life forever moving from one form to another the essence of the Buddhist teaching is contained in the Four Noble Truths, namely that there is suffering, that there is a cause of suffering. Now, this cause of suffering is ignorance okay, and, and desire, and that there is a cessation and end to suffering. There's a way to stop the suffering. And the fourth one is that there is a way to the cessation or end of suffering. This is the Eightfold Path. So, the truth of the suffering is like a disease. The truth of origin is like the cause of the disease. And the truth about the cessation is like the cure of the disease. And the truth of the path is like the medicine. So, the Buddha is often compared to a physician who diagnoses the disease and recommends medicine in order to overcome the illness. In the first two noble truths, he diagnosed the problem, suffering, and identified its cause, ignorance or craving. And the third noble truth is the realization that there is a cure. And the fourth noble truth is that there is a path to the cessation of suffering. So the Buddha set out the eightfold path. That's the prescription, the way to achieve release from suffering, then attain enlightenment and reach nirvana. 
Now, the fourth philosophy about the person in Oriental philosophy is Taoism. So we come now to the Chinese counterpart philosophy. The Taoism's conception of man is based on its understanding of the whole of the universe, which follows certain universal and unchanging laws. The way of the Tao, or the Tao, is universal. And since man is part of this universe, he must follow the way of the Tao. According to Lao Tzu, the Chinese master who is regarded to be the founder of Taoism and the author of the Taoist text, Tao Te Ching, the universe, when viewed holistically, expresses harmony, purpose, order, and calm power. But when we attempt to separate things, just to understand the parts without understanding the whole of reality, the result are error, suffering, and unhappiness. So Lao Tzu explains that the sense of the ultimate, the underlying great principle rule or cause of the way of all things. So the principle is the way of all things, the Tao. Ma now, let's go to man. Man, as part of the universe, must understand this invariable law of nature. And to be enlightened according to Lao Tzu is to know the invariable law of nature. There are many laws of nature, but among the laws that govern the change in nature or things, the most fundamental is that when a thing reaches one extreme, it reverts from it. This is the way or the rule of reversal, the law of reversal. And the man who comprehends this invariable, meaning unchanging, law, relies upon it for his action, does not follow his own partial opinion, and therefore is without prejudice. He follows the law of nature. So the enlightened man associates the Tao with spontaneity, with creativity. He frees himself from selfishness, and desire and appreciates simplicity. So the man who understands this invariable law acts naturally and spontaneously, and he avoids artificiality. Now, one important theory of the Tao or Taoism is Wu Wei. The goal of Wu Wei is to achieve a state of perfect equilibrium or a perfect alignment with the Tao, revealing the soft and invisible power within all things, and as a result, obtain an irresistible, irresistible form of soft and invisible power. Now, Wu Wei literally means action without action, or not acting, or without action, to do things without doing anything. Now, of course, that is impossible. Okay, that is impossible. How can we do without doing anything? According to Taoism, if one has too much of something, they become harmful rather than good. The purpose of doing something is to have something done or accomplished. But if there is overdoing, if there is excessive activity, then the result may be worse than not having the thing done at all. So the point of the Wu Wei is that it's not really not to do anything at all, but not to do or not to overdo something. Avoid the extremes. Stay at the middle. Act with spontaneity and naturalness. So, the Taoist philosophy recognizes that the universe already works harmoniously according to its own ways, according to its invariable laws. As a person exerts their will against or upon the world, they disrupt the harmony that already exists. Therefore, we, will, we need to always follow 
nature. Now, the last of the Asian or Oriental philosophies about man is Confucianism. The Confucian conception of the human person is centered on the proper conduct of man in society. The central idea in Confucian teaching is the cultivation of the human virtues. According to Confucius, the founder of this philosophy, every normal human being cherishes the aspiration to become a superior man or a jinchu. Confucius wanted his disciple to be more than just a literary or literati or a learned man or a Jew. He wanted them to be self or to be well-rounded men. Men who are not only literate but are also useful, meaning they can contribute to the state and to the society. Confucius concerned himself with the people's individual development, which he said takes place within the context of human relationships. And the basic human relationships for Confucius happens inside the family. In Confucianism, the sage or wise is the ideal personality. However, it is very hard to become one of them. Confucius therefore created the model of Junzu, a gentleman, which can be achieved by any individual. Traditionally, the Junzu is the nobleman. Only the noble can be a Junzu. But according to Confucius, one doesn't have to be part of the nobility to become a Junzu because one can develop his own virtues and become a real gentleman. So the Junzu is second only to the sage, and there are many characteristics of the Junzu. He can live in poverty, he does more and speaks less, he is loyal, obedient, knowledgeable, and he disciplines himself. The Junzu practices the virtues, the virtues of human heartedness or benevolence or the ren, righteousness, propriety, sincerity, filial piety, among other virtues. So, the ren or human heartedness is fundamental to become a Jinshu. The doctrine of ren stands out from the collection of thought that Confucius developed as a central thesis of his whole system. The ren is the perfect virtue and it is the cardinal principle of humanism. It expresses the ideal of cultivating human relations, developing human faculties, cultivating one's personality, and upholding human rights. The next virtue of importance is the yi, which means oughtness of a situation. This means that everyone in the society has a certain thing, certain thing which he must do or needs to do. But this must be done without ulterior motive. A righteous act is done without any selfish motive or intention. It implies an obligation or an imperative which is absolute and without conditions. The next virtue of importance is Li or propriety, which is the code of the ritual which embodies the essence of ancient Chinese culture. Although Li is translated as code or ritual, it means more in the Confucian tradition. It includes all forms of rituals, especially in connection with the proper conduct of the gentleman. So Li simply means the proper way of doing things. The gentleman is expected to act as moral guides to the rest of the society. He is expected to cultivate himself morally, show filial piety and loyalty where there are where there, these are due, and cultivate humanity or benevolence. And the great exemplar or example of the perfect gentleman is a sage at the same time is Confucius. The opposite of the Junzu is the Shaoren, which literally means small person. 
So the Shaoren is a person who is petty, who is uh, narrow-minded, self-interested, greedy, superficial, and materialistic. Aside from these four traditions, we also include Islam under the Oriental tradition because Islam also originated in Asia. Islam is one of the major monotheistic religions in the world. Muslims, like the Jews and the Christians, believe in one unique and incomparable God whom they address as Allah. The Quran asserts that Allah is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. He has always existed and will always exist. And the entire universe, the entire cosmos of created beings depends on Him and on Him alone for its existence. He does not depend on any of His creatures, but all His creatures depend on Him for their existence and for their needs. Allah hears, sees, and knows everything perfectly. His knowledge encompasses all things. He knows what has happened, what will happen, and how it will happen. He determines everything such that no affair occurs in the whole world without or except by His will. Islam emphasizes the importance of knowing oneself based on the divine source, the one who created him. Since the beginning, man has always been trying to know himself. But if he does not follow the divine revelation, then he becomes misguided and confused between two extremes, selfishness and worthlessness. Sometimes man thinks that he is the greatest in this universe and oppressive and arrogant that he no longer believes in Allah. Sometimes he thinks that he is weak and the most worthless being, so he submits before objects, the sun, the moon, and other beings other than Allah. So Islam's understanding of man revolves around the origin and the stages of his creation, of his good attributes, his faculty, to be receptive to good and evil. And his purpose in his life and the relationship between him and the rest of the creatures around him. The reality of man emanates from two origins. His first creation from mud when Allah made him and breathed into, his, into him life. His creation in the womb of his mother. This reality expressed in the Quran is meant to remove his arrogance and make man humble in his life and to submit to Allah. So man is an honored creature. Allah made a whole universe in the service of man. This is to motivate man to control what is around him from other creatures without having to humiliate himself to anything and to be without fear. Man was gifted by Allah with a faculty to distinguish and to choose between good and evil. Man possesses the ability to choose freely between these two ways and that his goal in this life is to raise himself well and elevate himself toward virtue. Man has a faculty that provides him the potential to learn and acquire knowledge. Among the gifts of Allah is the ability to learn and acquire knowledge and providing him with the tools of knowledge. Finally, man is responsible and accountable for the consequences of his deeds since he is given all these privileges which distinguish him from the rest of the creation and was entrusted with the creation then he must submit to the law of Allah and submit to Him alone. So, those are the oriental conceptions of man. Now, let's go now to the western conceptions. First, ancient Greek philosophy. Ancient philosophy is known as Greek philosophy. 
It is generally described as a cosmocentric philosophy because the search for truth of the Greeks is centered on the universe or nature or the cosmos. Man is conceived as part of nature or part of the cosmos. He is a microcosm, a small world in himself, and he possesses qualities of the animate and the inanimate worlds. One of the first important representatives of Greek philosophy is Socrates. Socrates is known as a moralist, a philosopher who advocated moral transformation among the citizens of Athens. One of his famous teachings is to know thyself. For Socrates, one can only transform oneself if he knows himself, if he examines himself. So, the Socratic dialogues written by student Plato contain his teachings and philosophy. The dialogue was his unique method of teaching. According to Socrates, the task of the philosopher is to provoke people into thinking for themselves rather than to teach them anything they did not or they, they don't know or they already know. His contribution to history of thought was not a systematic doctrine, but a method of thinking and a way of life that encourages analytical examination of one's own belief and a rational and critical approach to ethical problems. The next philosopher is Plato, who was a student or a follower of Socrates. Plato described humanity or man as imprisoned in a cave and mistaking shadows on the wall for reality. So these men, there are men who were imprisoned in a cave and they cannot be are chained, they cannot go out of the cave, outside of behind them is a fire so shadows are projected on the wall of the cave and these slaves or these prisoners thought that those shadows are real so they mistake the shadows on the wall as real now somebody was able to escape and he discovered that there was actually a fire behind them and the shadows or what they see in the walls are just shadows. And there is actually a reality, a real world outside of the cave. So that is the philosopher according to Plato. The person who penetrates the world outside the cave of ignorance and achieves a vision of the true reality. What Plato would call the realm of ideas. Now, personal virtue consists in a harmonious relation among the faculties of the soul. Fact, the, the desire, the appetites or passion, and the mind or reason. And social justice consists in the harmony among the classes of the society. The harmony that we find in the society is actually a projection of the harmony that we find in our own selves. The ideal state of a sound mind in a sound body requires that reason or the intellect control the desires and the passions. So reason, desires, and passions are the three parts of the person. So the ideal state also is requires that the wisest individuals rule the pleasure-seeking masses. That's where the notion of the philosopher king of Plato originates. The last philosopher is Aristotle. He defined man as a rational animal. Aristotle has studied under Plato for almost more or less 20 years. Now, according to Aristotle, there are three vital principles for souls. Namely, the vegetative soul, which is proper to the plants, the sentient soul, which is proper to the animals, and the rational soul, which is the soul of man, the rational soul. These souls have their corresponding faculties of powers, vegetative power, the sentient power, and the rational power. 
Now, in the rational soul of man, all these powers are inherent or they are all present. That's why man has the vegetative power, the sentient power, and the rational power. In man, the matter is the body, while the form is the soul. So man is composed of matter and form. Matter is the body. The form is the soul. The body is the physical principle of man, while the soul is the spiritual and vital principle. It is the soul that gives life to the body. And the body and the soul are incomplete in themselves. They need to join together to form a substantial unity. Now let's go to the medieval period, medieval philosophy. Medieval philosophy could generally be described as theocentric. Theocentric because the center or the search for truth is centered on God. The world, nature, and the universe are part of God's creation. Man is part of God's creation. Man was actually created in the image and likeness of God. Although St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas adopted the Greek philosophical traditions of Plato and Aristotle, their notion of man is centered on faith. Augustine and Thomas Aquinas were the central figures in medieval philosophy. Man is a being created in the image and likeness of God. St. Thomas, following the idea of the philosopher Boethius, introduced the idea of the human person as an individual substance of a rational nature. St. Thomas, following the ideas of these philosophers for him, like Boethius, assigned the name person to individual beings with rational nature. He says, a special name is given among all other substances to individual beings having a rational nature. And this name is the person. So man is the human person. And therefore, in this definition of person, the term individual substance is used to refer to a singular being in the category of substance, an individual substance. Rational nature is added to mean that this singular being among rational substances. So man has reason. Reason is a defining quality of man. The human person is a spiritual being, a being having rational, intellective soul and essence. And therefore, the person and the spiritual being ontologically are the same. The degree or kind of personality of a person corresponds to the spirituality of a spiritual being. Therefore, the human person and the human spiritual being also mean ontologically one and the same thing. And in the hierarchy of beings, man is the lowest person, the lowest spiritual being, because on top of him, there are the angels and, of course, God. Now, let's go to modern philosophy. The spirit could be generally characterized as anthropocentric and rationalistic. Anthropocentric because they focus more on man himself instead of focusing on on the, on the theos, on God, they focus on man himself, especially on his rational capacity. The search for truth is centered on man and human reason. And human reason was liberated from nature and faith, which was the character of philosophy back in the medieval era. One of the most important philosophers during the modern period is René Descartes. Descartes introduced the idea of the cogito, which emphasizes the thinking power and the consciousness of man. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. So what defines man as a person is his cogito, his thinking capacity, his thinking power. Descartes also believes that man is composed of two separate principles of source or substances, which he calls the res cogitans, or the mind, and the res extensa, or the body. So, the body and the mind 
or sometimes call it spirit, are two separate substances. And with this position of the card, he started what is known as the exaggerated type of dualism. Descartes believes that man is composed of two principles, two substances, accidentally joined together, the body and the soul or the mind. The relation or connection between the body and the soul or mind is purely accidental and mechanical. These two are distinct and separate. Descartes maintained the immortality of the soul, and he also maintained that mind and body are two distinct <coughs> substances. Thus, exam <coughs> <coughs> Thus, exempting mind from the mechanistic laws of nature and providing for the freedom of the will. This fundamental separation of mind and body raised the problem of explaining the way in which these two different substances as mind and body can affect each other. The empiricist thinkers of the modern period emphasized the empirical or experiential side of man, focusing on man's sense experience. The English philosopher Thomas Hobbes constructed a comprehensive system of materialistic metaphysics that provided a solution to the mind-body problem by reducing mind to the internal motions of the body. John Locke, another philosopher, important philosopher during the modern era, one of the most influential figures in British thought, attacked the prevalent rationalistic belief in knowledge independent of experience. According to Locke, he attempted to reduce all ideas to simple elements of experience, but he distinguished sensation and reflection as sources of experience. Sensation providing for the material of knowledge and of the external world and reflection, the material knowledge of the mind. Now let's go to the last stage or last philosophy, contemporary philosophy. With the predominance of the existential and phenomenological philosophers during the contemporary period, philosophy reads another third in its history, and of course, in its understanding about the human person. There occurred a number of changes in its character and in its topic, its object of discussion, and in its approach as an intellectual discipline. From the question of God, about nature, the metaphysical in the abstract, which was always been the interest of the past, in the medieval and in the modern, these contemporary philosophers shifted their attention to a more practical subject, to the question that concerned man most, his existence, human existence, the meaning of the existence of the human person. For the existentialist, the question that philosophy now tries to answer in its search for the truth is the meaning of human existence. The search for truth is now a search for meaning. And now man has the task of discovering and giving meaning to his existence. Man, the subject, is a giver or discoverer of meaning. The contemporary philosophers concern themselves with a new and unique evaluation of man, stressing more his subjectivity, meaning his interiority, his inner core, his freedom, and his relation with his fellow human beings or his fellow persons. They focus in their ideas on these vital matters and come up with a new interpretation of man, diverting themselves from the traditional definition of man as a rational animal. Instead, they regard man as a subject. By subject, it means a being with inner life, with interiority, with consciousness, an embodied spirit, or an incarnate subjectivity, meaning that man has a body who incar which incarnates his subjectivity or his interiority. So we have a subjectivity 
and it's our body that externalizes that subjectivity. Man, according to them, is first and foremost a subjectivity, a center, or a unique core, a wellspring of initiative and meaning, a stream of consciousness. And this subjectivity is not limited to rationality alone, but rather it includes the affective and the emotional as well. Man, according to them, does not only think, does not only reason, he can also feel, he can also love, he can also be angry, he can also desire, he can also believe, and so on and so forth. But then man is not a pure subjectivity or just a pure spirit. He is a subjectivity that incarnates, puts into flesh his subjectivity. And it is his body that puts into flesh that subjectivity. It is the body that puts into action those intentions. It incarnates the meaning and initiative that emanates from the inner core, from man's consciousness. So, man is not just a mere subject that exists alone in the world. One basic experience of man is that he lives in this world together with other men. Man is born into this world already inhabited by other people, already interpreted by other people. And these others are actually his fellow men. According to Buber, they are the Daos. And as he lives in this world, in this social and intersubjective world, he must enter into a personal relationship with his fellow human beings. And man received, therefore, a meaningful treatment in the works of the existentialists and the phenomenologists. And because of this treatment, their concern for the human person some of them tackled the questions of man, therefore they were called the philosophers of man. So that ends my presentation. Thank you very much. This is Joe Baguas.